The Lord be with you. Clap your hands, all you peoples. God has gone up with a shout of joy. The Lord Jesus Christ has risen to reign. His is the name above all names. We are witnesses. The Lord is risen. Christ has ascended to reign on high. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 11.30 a.m. service of morning prayer on this Ascension Sunday. It's really lovely to see you all today. We'll need two sheets this morning. We'll need our yellow order of service and our white hymn sheet for May and June. So make sure you have those. I'm assuming you do. If not, just give Norman a little nod there and he will sort you out. So let's turn together to our yellow uh, order of service. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. So let's confess our sins to God our Father and we'll take a moment of silence before we join together in our prayer of confession. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. And may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, may he have mercy upon you. May he pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We stand together. O oh Lord, open our lips. O oh God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Let's join in that famous hymn of praise, O oh Jesus, I have promised. It's just inside the uh, hymns and sheets and side cover.
take our seats. We take our seats for our Bible readings, and our first reading is our psalm this morning. We read Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Old Testament Bible reading this morning is from Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 17, beginning at verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They'll be a tree, they'll be like a tree, planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. This is the word of the Lord. And our New Testament Bible reading, our Gospel, is from Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 43. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. But an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. This is the word of the Lord. Let's stand together, turning to our yellow orders of service. And we declare our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, 
who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Lord be with you. We sit or kneel to pray. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. O Lord, save the Queen. Let your ministers be clothed in righteousness. O Lord, save your people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. O God, may clean our hearts within us. A collect for Ascension Sunday. O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Mercifully give us faith to know that, as he promised, he abides with us on earth to the end of time, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And a collect for mourning. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life, to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your protection, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In our intercessions this morning, we're going to use some prayers written by the Church of England for Ascension. Uh, there's a call and response in our prayers, so when I say, Lord, hear us, please respond, Lord, graciously hear us. Lord, hear us. So let us join our prayers with those of our Saviour Christ, seeking the Father's blessing and the gifts of the Spirit. Jesus Christ, great High Priest, living forever to intercede for us, we pray for the Church your broken body in the world. Lord, hear us. Jesus Christ, King of righteousness, enthroned at the right hand of the majesty on high, we pray for our world. Make it subject to your gentle rule. Lord, hear us. Jesus Christ, Son of Man, drawing humanity into the life of God. We pray for our brothers and sisters in need, those in distress or sorrow. Lord, hear us. Jesus Christ, pioneer of our salvation, 
bringing us to glory through your death and resurrection. Surround with your saints and angels those who have died trusting your promises. Lord, hear us. Jesus Christ, Lord over all things, ascended far above the heavens, filling the universe. We pray for ourselves that we would receive and use the gifts you give us for work in your service. Lord, hear us. Jesus Christ, keep the church in the unity of the Spirit and in the bond of peace, and bring the whole created order to worship at your feet. For you are alive and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And living God, as we turn to your word now, and as we continue our series looking at the things Jesus didn't say so that we can focus in on what he did say. We pray for your spirit to speak into our hearts. Would you be with Sonia now as she comes to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Ross. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. So, in the 21st century West, we're constantly bombarded with messages, aren't we, about the best way to live our lives, whether it's indirectly through books, social media, films, blogs, and so on, or whether we're specifically seeking out guidance about a situation in our life from friends, TED Talks, networks of people say, facing the same situation, and so on. As Ross said, last week we started a new series of talks on things Jesus didn't say. And we asked ourselves, what are the things that we take on board naturally, which don't come from Jesus, or maybe are even directly against his teaching? And we thought together last week about that lie that a life of following Jesus is always easy. We saw how Jesus doesn't promise us a storm-free life, but if we build our lives on him, that we will become storm-free people. If you missed that, do go to our YouTube channel and check it out. And this week, we're thinking about the phrase, Follow your heart. And this is the idea that's very prevalent in our culture, that we need to listen to what our heart, in other words, our feelings, our emotions, our passions, and our desires are saying to us. And if we follow that, then we will find the most fulfilling life. Other phrases that kind of tie into this that you might have heard are, look into your heart. Trust yourself. Follow your instincts. Your heart will never lead you astray. And even sometimes, excuses that people have for their bad behaviour, the heart wants what the heart wants. This can affect so much of what we do. The big things like our career choices, our decisions in romance, where we live, but also the smaller things such as our time management day to day, and our travel choices. In contrast to this, the Bible teaches that our hearts are unreliable guides. In the reading we had this morning from Jeremiah, we are told that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure, or some versions say desperately sick. Proverbs 21 too, tells us that every person 
Their way seems right to them in their own eyes. But that it is God who weighs the heart and sees what is truly right. So the reality is that while our heart isn't always wrong, it can easily be so. Our own human hunches can be wrong. We can feel very strongly about something and we can be wrong. Our own senses and feelings are partly rooted in our culture, our personality, our upbringing, our context, and they can cause us to misunderstand the truth of a situation, which can lead to disaster if we follow them unquestioningly. For Jesus, following the tradition of his people, the heart as a metaphor meant more than we would maybe understand in our modern English. The heart was the seat of wisdom. The psalmist wrote, teach us to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. In Exodus, we learn that generosity too resides in the heart. It talks about men and women whose hearts moved them as they brought their gifts for the building of the tabernacle. And the heart also contained bravery. Look to the Lord, says the psalmist, be strong and of brave heart. So when the Bible talks about the heart, it's referring to a profound centre of wisdom, skill, bravery, generosity. So with this in mind, if Jesus didn't say, follow your heart, did he say anything about the heart? I wonder if you can think of any times that Jesus mentions the heart. Have a wee think there in your seat, see what comes to mind. And you might have noticed one of those in the New Testament reading today. So just have a wee think, what did Jesus say about the heart? So here's a few that I thought of earlier, see if they match any of yours. He said, love the Lord with all your heart. He said that out of the heart comes all manner of evil. He warned that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But he also said, do not let your hearts be troubled. And to come to him, because I am gentle and humble in heart. I'm sure you can think of others. On a side note, the Bible overall talks a lot about the heart. It's mentioned in more than a thousand places. And for those of you who enjoy a topic-related Bible study, why not use your heart, the heart as the next study? Um, and that's when you look up every passage that has the word heart in it, read that passage, and ask God to speak to you and teach you his ways. This is a great way of studying the Bible. So we can see from those quotations of Jesus that he didn't dismiss the heart. Rather, he acknowledged the effect our heart can have on our actions, but challenged us to realign them. Jesus wants our hearts to be places of joy and peace, but rather than following them unquestioningly, he challenges us to bring them, like every part of our lives, into submission to God. So Jesus did not say, follow your heart. But what does he want to say to us here this morning? As I was praying and preparing for today, there were three things I think Jesus wants to underline on this topic. The first and most basic and obvious is, don't follow your heart, follow God and his ways. Now the reason most people think you should follow your heart is that we tend to think that this will give us the best and most fulfilled life. But the Bible actually says in many places that following God is a much better strategy for this. Now I want you to think with me about some verses that back this up. So if I say, seek first the kingdom of God, what's the next bit? All the other things will come to you. He will give the other things, yes. So God will provide for us if we follow his ways. What about whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. 
Or do you remember what Jesus said about why he came? I have come that they might have life in all its fullness. So if we want to have a fulfilled life, then following God is a better strategy. The upside down nature of the kingdom of God, which we've talked about before, is that when we do put God first, when we truly follow his ways, then we'll also receive the benefits of fulfillment, peace, joy, freedom, security, and all those things that we might be looking for if we follow our hearts. That's not to say, like we looked at last week, that everything will always be easy for us, but that we will gain much of this fulfillment. The Old Testament presents, in a lot of places, two ways of living life. Those of us who spent some time in Deuteronomy before Easter in those Bible studies saw that God presents a way of blessing and a way of curses. And we saw that also, didn't we, in our Jeremiah passage today. The way of barrenness is to put your trust in yourself or other people, but the way of fruitfulness is to put your trust in God. So don't let's follow our hearts, but let's follow Jesus. Get to know his ways by knowing and studying and understanding the Bible, by learning from other Christians, by listening to good teaching, by listening to the Holy Spirit as he shares things with you, and by obeying what he tells us in the little things and the big things. Now there are some things in the Bible where it takes some interpretation to know what God's ways are, and where different Christians actually disagree maybe about God's ways in a particular situation. But actually that's a small percentage compared to so much that is very clear. Jesus tells us to be kind to all we meet, not to gossip, to be truthful in all we say, to be faithful to our marriage partners, to pay our taxes, to forgive anyone who's wronged us, to be generous, to pray for and honour those in authority, to give to the poor, and so many other things. And sometimes these things aren't easy, or these things won't be uppermost in our feelings and desires, in our heart, if you like, but we do them because we follow Jesus, not our hearts. So, first thing, follow God and his ways. The second thing I think Jesus was impressing upon me in preparation is that we need to allow God to change our hearts. So the passage today tells us that our heart is desperately sick. And there's much in the Bible about problems in our hearts. The New Testament passage we read, Jesus talked about the evil that comes out of people's hearts. We hear it across the Old and New Testament. You might remember the prophet Ezekiel talks about us having hearts of stone but that God wants to replace that with a heart of flesh. I wonder if you've heard this quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, a 20th century Russian novelist, philosopher, historian, political prisoner, Nobel Prize winner, but also a devout Russian Orthodox Christian. And he said, the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. This line shifts. Inside us, it oscillates with the years. And even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good is retained. Our hearts, sadly, do have a terrible capacity for evil, but God can transform them and make them more and more pure and full of compassion. The psalmist David prayed, create in me a pure heart, O God. And this is what we should be praying daily. So how do we allow God to change our hearts? Like so many things in the Christian side, there's a positive thing that we can do and a negative side as well. On the positive, we can turn our hearts to God. We can learn to delight in God. Praise and worship, 
meditating on God's character, reveling in the stories of God's goodness in the Bible, in history, in current accounts of people across the world, within our church family. Let's ask each other about what God has done in our lives and let's enjoy that. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. As we grow in loving God and taking pleasure from him, we will see more and more things that our hearts want. Partly because God changes our hearts to desire better and better things as we immerse ourselves in him. But the flip side of that is shown in the command to guard our hearts. Proverbs 4 verse 23 tells us to guard our heart because everything we do flows from it. Like Jesus said, good things flow out of a good heart, bad things flow out of a bad heart. So we want to guard our hearts. We want to let good things in and focus on good things and keep bad things out so that it becomes more and more pure, kind, compassionate, truthful, humble and so on. This is a warning to us, really, not to just let anything in, any teaching, any gossip, any person that would draw us away from Jesus. Of course, we live in the world and we can't avoid everything that's evil, but we can guard our hearts. We can test things that we hear and see against what Jesus says and only dwell on things that are in line with him. So, following God is the best way. Let God change our hearts. And thirdly, trust God to look after our hearts. Maybe some of this talk has been a bit heavy. There is a discipline that's required in the Christian life and we need to take decisive action to follow Jesus, which can be hard. But we also need to remember and enjoy and rest in the reality that we are children of a loving, powerful, heavenly Father the one who is our good shepherd, the one who is supremely faithful, powerful and trustworthy, who loves us beyond our capacity to understand it and has shown that love for us by dying on the cross for us. I wonder if you enjoyed the description in our reading about the one who trusts in the Lord and it echoes one of my favourite verses which was also our psalm for today in Psalm 1. I've thought about having it tattooed somewhere because it's so my vision of what I want to be. Like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Jeremiah says that those who are confident in God, trusting in him, are like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear th fruit. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Jesus didn't say to follow your heart, but he did say not to let your hearts be troubled and to learn from his gentle and humble heart. We can trust him to look after our hearts. You all know this one as well, I'm sure. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. There's something simple about following Jesus. There's something that's about being a child, putting your hand into his hand. We don't need to rely on ourselves. We don't need to rely on trusting our own hearts to have all the answers. They never will. Because we'll never know everything. And because we live in a broken world. But we can commit our hearts and our ways to God who does know everything. Who is the all-powerful, all-knowing and all-loving one. We can trust him with every step of our lives because we know that he cares for us. Jesus didn't say follow your heart because he knew that actually without his lordship our hearts are deceitful and actually sick. But he wants to transform and heal them so that they might come in line with him. 
Let's work with him to make that happen. Follow Jesus in his ways. Allow him to change your heart and trust him to look after it. And when we do this, no matter what life throws at us, we can claim that vision of who we are, a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. I'm praying that for each one of us here today and in the days ahead. Amen. Thanks, Sonia. Thanks, Sonia. We're going to respond in, in worship, in song worship. We're going to turn to our white song sheets. We're going to sing together, Breathe on me, breath of God. You'll see there, verse 2. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure. Until with thee I will one will to do and to endure. Let's use this as our prayerful response to what we've been hearing about, that God would mould our hearts to be in line with his heart. We stand to sing. seats. Oh, may that be our prayer in this week ahead, that the Holy Spirit would breathe on us and mould our hearts. Just a few notices before we conclude our service with uh, a closing prayer. Um, this Tuesday night, we've been announcing we're beginning a five-week prayer course. It's um, particularly focusing on an unanswered prayer, unanswered prayer. And uh, it will be on Zoom at 8 p.m. for the next five weeks. The format is that there's a bit of teaching, a bit of a video conversation, and then we have an opportunity to talk through the different issues raised. So I commend it to you. Do join in with that uh, on Zoom from this Tuesday. Uh, the login details 
will be on all the usual social media platforms. If you haven't a clue what I'm talking about, talk to us too and we will link you up and show you how to connect with that through Zoom, okay? Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday and uh, we're going to be celebrating Holy Communion together next Sunday. Uh, in line with the ongoing restrictions, how we'll do that is you'll stay in your seats and we'll bring you the bread and the wine in individual cups. So we'll do it as safely as is possible. Um, and obviously if you choose not to partake for any reason at all, you just have to indicate like this. So don't stay away. In fact, come hungry to take the bread and the wine and to celebrate Pentecost with us next Sunday. The end of the month of May 29, we're having a day of prayer and we'll be joining in with Christian Aid's climate change prayer chain for that day. So how that works is that each of us signs up for an hour to pray um, using the resources that we'll send out that week. Again, the uh, sign up details are on the usual channels, but if you would like to sign up and you're not au fait with those usual channels, just say, Ross, I'd love to pray from nine to 10, say, or from one to two, and we'll make sure that we add you in there. It'd be great if as many of us as possible were praying with Christian Aid. And then finally, thank you for the way that you've been uh, following the uh, protocols about coming in and out of the building. And again, just to remind you, please just follow Norman's guidance whenever we finish the service so that we don't all bottleneck at the door. Let's get out into the open air and then we can chat away. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. May God the Father who has given to his Son the name above every name, may he strengthen you to proclaim Christ Jesus as Lord. May God the Son who is our great High Priest passed into the heavens, may he plead for you at the right hand of the Father. And may God the Holy Spirit who pours out abundant gifts upon the church make you faithful servants of Christ our King. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Amen. Waiting expectantly for the promised Holy Spirit, go in the peace of Christ. <laughs>